Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. By way of introduction, last week we talked about the times of 1 Peter, and I want to repeat that this morning for emphasis. Peter writes about suffering, and he writes about submission. And one of the things we noted last week is in 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, where Peter talks about submission basically in the affairs of your daily life. And he was speaking about that in the context of being submissive in all of life, even to the affairs of government. And if you recall, he wrote this letter in about A.D. 64, when Nero was just about to go through the worst of his behaviors, A.D. 64. He set the fire in Rome and blamed the Christians for it, basically. Had always wanted to remodel Rome in his own image, and he really couldn't tear down long-standing edifices, but there was a way to get around that, and that was to burn the city, which would then give him the opportunity to rebuild it, which is what he did. And he blamed the Christians for it, and you know the rest. Well, that was beginning in A.D. 64, about the time Peter wrote these words, and Peter says... Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors. To submit yourself to an evil government seems wrong. And yet Christians are never called to be revolutionaries in the traditional sense. All of the epistles urge submission to government. They urge, if you will, a kind of voluntary suffering. Suffering produces separation. And down through the history of the church, if you've ever read Fox's book of martyrs, the martyrs are the spark, really, that keeps doctrine and purity and the word alive. Now, we're going to continue on today with a subject that we broached last week. In a lot of churches, these words would just be politely glossed over. They don't exist. Let's move right on to the next chapter, folks. But no, we're going to talk about them. 1 Peter 3.3 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they obey not the word, they also may be without the word won by the conversation of the wives. This is in the context, remember, of being submissive in the matters of state, government, in matters of business and daily life. The next level is being submissive in marriage. These words are often deemed almost too controversial to talk about these days, but that just leads me all the more to want to talk about them. Verse 2 says, While they behold your chaste conversation, that is lifestyle, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that of outward adorning, plating of hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man or person of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now that calls for some work, that sixth verse, and we're going to do that in a minute. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. What are we talking about here? Well, for one thing, and we mentioned this last week, Peter hypothesizes a marriage here in which a believing wife is married to an unbelieving husband. This is quite unlike the example given by Paul in Ephesians 5, where you have husbands loving your wives, wives be submissive to your husbands, and so forth, in which you have two believers married. This is a different situation in a different place, because this letter, as you know, is written to Hebrew Christians in Babylon. And to review, Babylon had a huge Jewish population during the first century. The Jewish population there had remained after the Babylonian captivity for four centuries. And so there was a huge and rather important segment of the community in Babylon who were, if you will, very, very stringent Jewish worshipers. And now the gospel comes to them and urges them to receive the good news of the risen Christ. And so some of these Jews in Babylon, at the leading of Peter and Silas in particular in Babylon, came to Christ. Well, here's an example of a wife who I think is probably a Jewish woman, 
who is a Hebrew Christian. Her husband probably is still a Jew. He is in the synagogue and he considers himself to be the Lord of the household in traditional Jewish fashion. And Peter says, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the lifestyle or behavior of their wives. As we mentioned last week, the wife is to become a sort of living sermon to a husband. Now, there's no place in Scripture that urges wives to become preachers of righteousness. Like, as I mentioned last week, before she serves the pancakes, you get 15 minutes on salvation. It's not that kind of a deal at all. What it is here is a recognition of the fact that something new has happened through Christ. Marriage, after the resurrection of Christ, changed utterly. The relationship between Christ and the church became the model for marriage. And the idea of the merging of two people into one flesh it was based upon the merging of Christ and the church. And Paul gives that in Ephesians chapter 5. He said, this is a great mystery. Nevertheless, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Well, what's going on here? The apostles were very interested as they traveled into the outskirts of the Roman Empire in establishing Christian communities that were quite different from Judaic communities that already existed throughout the Roman Empire. Different in the respect that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither male nor female, there is a oneness. And that oneness also penetrates the marriage. What we have here then is what Paul talked about, namely voluntary submission. Voluntary submission, the whole idea of voluntary submission is very, very important. There must be headship in the family And spiritual leadership must be maintained so that there's some order moving through the family, just as it moves through the church. But the key to Christian marriage, as given by Paul, is picked up right here by Peter. You remember what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3? Don't do anything through argumentation or arrogance, but in lowliness of mind, that is, in humility of mind, Let each person esteem the other better than themselves. He was speaking here in terms of the congregation. He said, you should always look at others as being better than you are. And he uses Christ's own example. In Philippians, Christ emptied himself of all of his glory and descended to earth to accomplish a purpose, at which time he ascended back to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. In other words, he emptied himself of glory, and Christians are supposed to do the same thing during their lives, during our lives. We empty ourselves of glory. Now, i got to tell you, to be a member of the human club, you carry your glory around on your shoulder. I mean, that's what people do. You've got to show people how smart you are. You've got to show people, you know, that you're with it, you're cool, you are capable, you are confident, you are competent, besides that handsome, rich, and whatever else. You're flaunting yourself wherever you go, right? That's what humans do. Tool up in your Corvette, you know, and before you turn the engine off, you go, voopa, voopa, and then you... (laughs) That's to let everybody know that you've got a Corvette unless you're driving a Ferrari. In that case, you just let it idle, and everybody hears the 12-cylinder engine out there, and they know. But anyway, you want to push yourself. You want to show people how good you are. You want to be upbeat, positive, outgoing. You don't want to be internalized, depressive. You want to look like a success, be a success, feel like a success, And Jesus wants that too, except his recipe is different from the world's recipe. His recipe is a voluntary humility. And once you learn that, then suddenly you have a whole identity that's built around Christ and not the Ferrari, if you know what I mean. So what Peter is doing here is preaching an entire change of lifestyle to Christians, and in this case, particularly Hebrew Christians, I believe, and historically that can be well documented. He says, wives, 
be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, this is voluntary subjection. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about submission in a minute and what it is. And this is as a testimony to your husband. Verse 2, who beholds your chaste lifestyle coupled with respect. Wow. That's a big order. That's a tall order. I'm speaking to you wives. That's a tall order. This <laughs> jerk doesn't deserve any respect, right? Well, yes, he does. <laughs> Who's adorning? Let it not be that of outward adorning. You know, have you ever noticed adorning these days has gone up completely out of, out of all proportion? Now you're nobody if you haven't had a nose job and a liposuction or two and whatever. The lengths to which women are going, and now men too, in order to impress everybody with a hairstyle, with a new physical look, with the jewelry, the clothing, and so forth, is just outrageous. Actually, not as outrageous as it was in the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, it was unbelievable what women did to make themselves quote-unquote attractive. Their hairstyles sometimes took weeks to complete. One Roman woman, if you want to read about her, you can read about her in Gibbon's Decline, Fall of the Roman Empire, actually had a birdcage woven into her hairstyle along with diamonds and rubies and so forth so that she could keep little living birds inside of that cage as she <laughs> pranced about and displayed her wealth. Little ortolans, you know, in a little birdcage. I mean, they went to great lengths to be quote-unquote attractive. I don't want to go out with any woman who has a birdcage on her head, but that's another story. But <laughs> back in Rome, do as the Romans do, I suppose. But this is the context in which he's writing. He says, yes, you can really gussy yourself up, but a better way is to allow your hidden person, the person of the heart. And the heart, of course, in the Bible is always the symbol of motivation, your internal motivation. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price, for after this manner of old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. So he's talking about internal adornment here. Sarah, Ruth, Rachel, the women of the Old Testament were incredible examples of this kind of life. Sarah is given as an example here in verse 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, having said that, I ask a question. Believe me, this question is often asked, <laughs> sometimes with wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the question is, what do women want? And, of course, all you men know <laughs> what women want, right? Sure you do. <laughs> I think I know what women want. The Bible really tells you what women want, and it's so clear. Women want security. Now, I can hear many of those minds out there working right now saying, well, that's not enough. You didn't go far enough. There's a lot more that women want. No, women want security. And they are wired in that way. They want to build a nest. They want to stabilize. They want to plan. They want to have a place to raise children. In an unchanging environment, they want to have a good provider or provision of some sort. Their lives are structured around the concept of security. Now, what do men want? Yeah, what do men want? <laughs> All you wives out there know what men want, right? I'll tell you what they want. Men want significance. Significance. Oh, sure, they want security and so forth, but men really are wired because they want significance. They want to venture out into the world, pack that knapsack, and when they're 17 years old, head out there on the road and thumb their way into Los Angeles and, and become a great movie producer, whatever, right? Men want significance. Women want security. Now, where does security meet significance? In Christ. And hardly anywhere else. Look at the world today. Look at what's happening in marriage. She wants security. He wants significance. They're going opposite directions. And how do you find significance? Well, you get two or three degrees. You 
get a corner office, you get that Ferrari we were talking about, and when you're about 40, you drop your first wife and marry a younger model, right? That's significance in, in the worldly sense, right? It's a pattern. It's a pattern, but not in Christ. You find your significance in and through Christ, in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Am I connecting here with, do you understand what I'm saying? Only, and I've said this many times before, only in Christ is a successful marriage possible. Now that seems awfully dogmatic, but I'm dogmatic in that respect. And I have seen enough of the world to see that outside of Christ, a truly successful marriage is a virtual impossibility because he wants his significance, she wants her security, they want different things. They're not synchronized. They're not meshed. They're not one flesh. They're not a good testimony. And only after they come together in Christ do those ideas begin to merge in oneness. And you can look back at where you were 20, 30 years ago, and you can see that you were just totally out of sync with anything that was at all sensible. But when Christ gets hold of your life and begins to internally motivate you, and the hidden person of your heart begins to come forth in the power of the Spirit, suddenly everything changes. And in marriages, and I've often seen this, where Christ is not a central issue, there's always this bubbling, fermenting difficulty in which each is trying to dominate the other, in which people are pulling in different directions. When the Spirit of Christ comes into a marriage, even though those two people are still individuals, stubborn, outrageous, selfish at times, they come together progressively, increasingly, until their marriage becomes the biblical model. Let's discuss the details here. Women want security. Men want significance. The Bible says, wives, voluntarily submit yourself to your husband. Let's read on. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. And what I'm about to read after this is highly controversial. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now that's uh oh language if there ever was uh oh language. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. You know, it's fascinating that today, and for the last, oh, I'm going to say 80 or 90 years, it's been very popular to think of men as weaker and women as stronger. This idea first became really fashionable back in the 30s. If you remember the old black and white movies, uh, Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, Woman of the Year, Adam's Rib, Rosalind Russell, you remember those urbane comedies of manners, the old movies back in the 30s, where the wife was 10 times brighter than the husband, always leading him on a merry chase. He follows her and takes care of her little doggy while she accomplishes great things, and the whole thing is set as comedy. Well, as we come up into the latter years of the 20th century, we find in public entertainment the picture of man as stupid and weak. Did you ever watch a TV commercial? Sure you did. The man is unsettled, unsure, uncertain, stupid, vacillating, whiny. Honey, I've got a cold and I don't know what to do. And she brings this remedy and says, you've got to take this bottle of El Coldo here and you'll be all better. Oh, really? Yes, you will. And then he takes it and he's all better, thanks to his smart wife. The whole idea of selling things to people now is done on the basis of the guy is stupid and needy. His only joy in life is going out with the guys, playing golf, or maybe watching a football game and bending the elbow. She, meanwhile, gathers with her friends, and they have this kind of sisterhood of society in which they get together to complain about how rotten their husbands are. But the husbands are stupid, the wives are smart, and in a family structure, the kids are smarter than either the husband or the wife, but the wife is certainly smarter than the husband. You know the picture that's being sold of the American family, even the family of the world today. Women are thought to be mentally and physically stronger. They're thought to be more psychologically stable. There are numbers of studies that have been done to quote unquote prove this fact. 
women are thought to be more spiritual. Am I wrong? Oh, men are not interested in spiritual stuff, you know. They like their cars, their whatever. They like their football games, basketball games, and so forth and so on. They like to fish. And when they do have a spiritual moment, it is communing with nature on the 18th hole or out there in that little old inlet where the big bass are known to lie. That's man's spiritual nature. A woman is much more spiritually inclined than a man, actually more religious than a man. Women are kind of religious, and men just kind of couldn't care less, right? So as we develop this whiny, stupid, selfish, irreligious, lover of the great outdoors, modern man, who in public entertainment is often kicked in various parts of his anatomy to the great delight of an audience, we got an upside down and backwards picture of what people really are from God's perspective. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that is your wives, according to knowledge. What does that mean? Dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Epignosis. Did you ever stop and think about that? What does that mean? That means you husbands, you cloths, <laughs> you insensitive beast. No, that means you husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. That means you begin to know your wife. What does that entail? That entails getting to know her needs, her desires, her heart, her methods, her relationship with the Lord, and only then can you give honor to your wife as unto the weaker vessel. Are women weaker than men? It's a big, big question today. In these days of feminism, political correctness, and the glass ceiling, and whatever else you want to talk about, it's very commonly thought that, oh no, uh, women have been suppressed by these brutish men now for centuries and they're having their turn. They're going to get to express themselves at long last. But what are we really talking about? In secular society, we're talking about kind of revenge. The revenge of the repressed housewife. Well, all of that is unbiblical. What is biblical is life in Christ that produces a particular lifestyle and it produces the ability to voluntarily submit. Now, remember that verse I read a minute ago? Verse I read a minute ago, let nothing be done through argumentation or arrogance, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. How can you possibly do that unless you are empowered by the Spirit of God? The answer is you can't. Without the Spirit of God, you couldn't possibly do that. It's just not in the fallen human nature to do that. But in the nature exalted through the Spirit of God, this is not only possible, but it is the absolute delight of life. You know, Peter traveled with a wife. Did you know that? He traveled with a wife and children on the road. Historically, there is quite a good documentation of the fact that Peter was very much a family man, so much so that he went way out of his way to make life comfortable for his wife and children. He traveled from Babylon back to Rome with his wife. And when he and his wife were executed by the Romans, his wife was executed first, and then he was crucified upside down. Their children had been given a number of very problematic episodes before this. So Peter was a family man. He's, he was not just out there a lone eagle of some kind who left his wife behind. In fact, his eldest daughter, her name was Petronia, which is the feminine diminutive form of Peter. Petronia was thought to be one of the most beautiful women, young women, who was alive in that day. Absolutely gorgeous. There is a story about her in Rome and about her death in Rome. But I say all this just to say that Peter was a family man. He's not writing ex cathedra. He's not writing theoretically or hypothetically. He's writing as a man who had a successful family and knew how to nurture his wife and his children. 1 Corinthians talks about Peter visiting Corinth. He took his wife. He was apparently imprisoned twice in the city of Jerusalem, went to Babylon, got in some trouble there, traveled back to Rome, got in trouble there, but all the time his wife was with him. 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, or Peter? 
The Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a help suitable for him. And when Jesus was come to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick of a fever. There are all kinds of documentation in the Bible that Peter was very much a family man. So when he's writing here in chapter 3, I think he's writing about his own family. I really do. His wife, no doubt, lived in voluntary submission to him. He, no doubt, honored her and the children in a very special, even to the point of giving up his life for them, if need be. That's the love of Christ. I kind of skipped across one thing, though. I haven't really answered this question about what is meant by giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Obviously, if the Bible says it is true, (laughs) what is meant by this? In what way is a woman weaker than a man? I'll tell you what, I've seen a lot of women that I would put up there as being pretty much stronger than a man. You know what I'm saying? Constitutionally stronger, and maybe in some cases even physically stronger. I've known some strong women, lots of ways. But there is one way, and I tell you this on the basis of many years of experience and experience with studying the Word, there is one way that a woman is weaker than a man a very significant way. And that is in the ability through thick and thin, utter perseverance to cling to an ideological approach to life that cuts through emotion, cuts through need. I think a man is much more capable constitutionally of objectivity, even ruthless objectivity, that's sometimes called for in the administration of Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine, it does not dwell in the domain of emotionality. Christian doctrine does not dwell in showbiz. It does not dwell in feeling what feels good. It doesn't dwell in the arena of what looks good. Christianity dwells in the Word and the sound interpretation of the Word and the handing down of the teachings of the Apostles. It has to be done systematically, if you will, dogmatically, purposefully. And I believe that a man is constitutionally put together in a much better way to do this. And in this sense, a man is stronger than a woman. We could have a long conversation about this afterwards if you'd like. But you see what's being talked about here. The marriage is a model of the church in which the bridegroom is married to the bride. He has totally given himself up for her. In response, she voluntarily submits to him. The marriage on earth becomes a type of the marriage in heaven. And the administration of the marriage has to be done decently and in order through the word. And to the male has been handed the incredibly great responsibility of maintaining a systematic theology based upon the teachings of the apostles. Verse 8, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, that is, merciful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. We are the inheritors, by the way, of a blessing. Verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and eschew it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Psalm 34 says this, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Peter is just quoting a psalm here. And his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off remembrance of them from the earth. This is something that is very, very hard to understand. It's like any kind of suffering. We were talking earlier about the suffering of pain, of Christian suffering pain. How do you understand that? 
Well, how do you understand this? The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His face is against those that do evil. Have you ever seen evil people get rewarded? Of course you have. Have you ever seen righteous people get the short end of the stick or get hurt or injured? Of course you have. How do you fit all this into a theology? How do you understand? Particularly when God says he'll bless you if you behave in a certain way and then you see people behave that way and they don't appear to be blessed. In fact, they may suffer. We started this study some weeks ago with Peter's statement about Paul. He says, Paul has written some things hard to be understood. Well, I want to tell you, Peter's written some things hard to be understood too. Because your conduct in suffering is a very central part of your Christian walk. Verse 13, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Roman persecution. I'm thinking back to the days of Roman persecution. Peter is saying these words and he's saying, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you are happy. It says in the Greek, makarioi, which means you all are blessed. You are blessed. You're blessed if you suffer for righteousness sake. Have you ever suffered for righteousness sake? And I, you know, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but think about it. If so, you're blessed. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Do you remember what Peter's answer always was? Every time Peter got up to preach, remember what he preached on? He always preached on the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't miss an opportunity. You can look at every sermon of Peter in the whole New Testament. Every statement that he makes in public is always centered upon the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what he's asking, I think, other people to do here is sanctify the Lord God in your heart. In other words implant in your heart the unswerving motivation to do that which is Christ-like and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's within you. What is the hope that is within you? Well, I can tell you what's within me. I am a firm believer that the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout one of these days and he's going to take the believers home and Give them a new body in the process. In other words, there's going to come a day of the general resurrection of the righteous. And at that time, we'll receive a brand new immortal body just like Christ's immortal body. That's the hope that's in me. So if some skeptic says to me, well, what makes you think that? Well, I just go back to what Peter said. He preached, and all the others who were his contemporaries preached of the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's on the basis of Christ's physical resurrection that I know I'm going to have a physical resurrection in a beautiful six foot five body with wavy blonde hair and a jutting jaw. <laughs> Forget I said that. I don't know what I'm going to look like, but it'll be good. I have this hope in me. I really do. It's not a fiction. It's not a fantasy. It's just based on the same thing that Peter based his hope on, the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did it happen? Yes. Okay, that's good enough for me. And all of the rest after that is simply the acquisition of details that support the central fact of his physical resurrection. He says, be ready always. And believe me, I am. I love it when somebody challenges me on my belief. It's just I look at that as a golden opportunity to present the resurrection of Christ and all of the details that surround it. Had a call last night. He wanted to know what I thought about the rapture of the church. And he informed me that he didn't think there was going to be such a thing, and in fact, Christians are going to go through the tribulation. And did that make me unhappy? No, not at all. I just welcomed that as a wonderful opportunity to have a conversation with a man who's obviously searching. Although he was preaching to me, it was a wonderful opportunity. 
And we had a good conversation about the physical resurrection of Christ, by the way. I never forget that because Peter never forgot it. And he said, be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. In other words, you're not going to lord it over him. You're not going to be arrogant. You're not going to pull some intellectual gun on the guy to try to shoot him down. But you're conversing with him in meekness and fear. You present yourself to a challenger as humble and in the fear of the Lord. In that way, the spirit can work. It's the same spirit that pervades a happy marriage, the spirit of mutual submission in meekness and fear. Absolutely contrary to human impulse. The human condition is not built around voluntary humility, meekness, and fear. It's built around showing everybody else how tough you are. But a new life in Christ involves putting on sometimes very uncomfortable new clothing, by the way, until you learn how it fits and how to adjust it. And bit by bit, you become this new creature in Christ, and you are able to exist in voluntary humility. And that's not only in the relationship between me and my wife, it's also in the relationship between me and you and me and the guy picking out a head of lettuce next to me at the Homeland store. It's that voluntary submission that I think is the greatest exhibit of the Christ-like life. What, me submit? Somebody might take advantage of me if I did that. Well, yes, they might. What else is new? Do you have a good conscience? You know, (laughs) that's worth a million bucks right there. A good conscience. And it says right here, verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good behavior in Christ. There are growing numbers of opportunities these days to have people speak evil of you. To have people speaking evil of you is becoming more and more possible if you are a faithful Christian. Because Christians are becoming a kind of laughing stock in 21st century society. They believe in really stupid stuff like creation. And they believe in the miracles of the Bible, which no right-thinking intellectual person can possibly believe. Christians are really uh, kind of gullible, dumb people who meet once a week to support their stupid ideas. That's the way Christians are being looked at these days. That's all right. Have a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. This idea of suffering is a central theme of the first epistle of Peter. And one of the reasons that I believe it's so important to remember the context of first Peter, you remember he's writing to the diaspora specifically. Now, if anybody has known suffering, it has been the Jews in the diaspora. They have, if you will, raised suffering to an absolute art form. As Isaac Stern once said, Jews play violins rather than piano for the most part because you can't run with a piano on your back. It's the history of Judaism to be the laughing stock of society. It was the history of Hebrew Christianity in the days of Peter and Paul to be the laughing stock of society. They hated Jesus. Jesus said, you know, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. This idea of bearing up under suffering is a central part of the Christian life. And what is so interesting about suffering? Suffering produces obedience to the will of God. It does. And I hate to be the bearer of this news. I mean, I hate to tell you about that because that means I may be telling you that God may call upon you to suffer at some point in your life. Well, you wouldn't be the first. But you have to remember, suffering produces obedience to God's will. We're not a bunch of masochists who run around seeking suffering, or at least we should not be, but we need to know how to handle suffering when it comes. Verses 18 through 22. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. And notice Peter is writing this. He was put to death, how? In the flesh. 
don't ever separate physicality from the acts of Christ on earth. The Gnostics did. The Gnostics believed that Christ came in a spirit body and that he never lived on earth as a physical man. It was all an illusion. He just came here for a while. He only appeared to die in the flesh and then he went back to heaven. And because God is separate from the earth as a spirit being and never touched the earth as a physical person, say the Gnostics, therefore it is possible to go on and live in sin because even God himself never touched the earth, they say. He was only just a spirit being. And he would never stoop so low as to become a physical being because physical beings get dirty, they sweat, they have to have their feet washed, etc. And God, according to Gnostic theology, would never stoop that low to become a physical being. And yet he did. And he suffered. And he sweat and he bled. And then he overcame it all. He was put to death in the flesh, verse 18, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ and the Spirit here are differentiated. By which, that is through the means of, or within the sphere of, the Holy Spirit, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. There's been a lot of argument about that. Did Jesus actually go down to Hades and preach to the spirits in prison? I think he did. Verse 19, it says that he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The word for preach there is ekruxen, which comes from the root keruso, which means to proclaim something. Now, when we think of preaching in our day, we think of persuading. Like you preach to somebody to persuade them to come to your particular perspective. And the longer you preach, the better chance you have of getting them to come over to your side, right? Well, that's not what this word means. Keruso in Greek means to proclaim something as fact. It's already happened. It's done. Christ went, I am convinced, to the regime of Hades, down to those realms, multi-stratified realms, dimensional realms that are spoken of variously as Hades, Sheol, Tartaros, various words in Scripture. The dark world where those denizens of the deep are awaiting the final judgment. And they might have had some hope of escaping with their lives except that Jesus came and did what he did and having done that he went down there and said boys listen up <laughs> your goose is cooked I have finished the work the father sent me to do and guess what you're all under the death penalty and I just came here and thought I'd tell you that before I ascend it to heaven and you think I'm making that up Ephesians 4 9 and 10 say concerning the gift that Christ gave to the world now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? The he here is Christ. Paul is writing about this in Ephesians 4, 9, and 10. And Paul says, he that descended, that's Christ, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus, and by the way, we can also read about this in Colossians, but Jesus very, very obviously had work to do that was based upon the protocols of heaven. Having fulfilled those protocols, having fulfilled every jot and tittle, every divine rule that could possibly ever exist, he went down and he told the fallen angels, the demons, he told the archons, as they are called in the Bible. And sometime we should talk about the archons. That's a marvelous story. Jesus proclaimed to the archons, I have done it. You have no further opportunity to destroy the coming of my kingdom. He went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometime, that is once, back in the old days, were disobedient. And we all know about that back in the days before the great flood. By the way, we 
Childish Christians also believe in the great flood of Noah that covered the whole earth. Wow. That's fairly naive, isn't it? Geologically speaking, that just can't happen. There's not enough water, right? So, anyway, those spirits were, back in the days of Noah, disobedient. They were lawbreakers. They came to set up their own little petty kingdoms. They came out of the realm of heaven. They are called the B'nai Elohim. They came, took wives. They set up their little grand duchies, their little dominions, their little piece of the planet, and said, here we are, we're going to run it. And they absolutely ran it into the ground. There was only one righteous family left, and that was the family of Noah. And God said, I regret it, but I'm going to have to destroy the world because of what these spirits have done. I want to finish here with a thought that I would like to develop next week because this is really a very central thought. Noah in the ark is a great type and a symbol, and Peter gives it here. Verse 21, the like figure, or the type here, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That takes us back up to verse 16. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels, authorities, powers being made subject to him. Noah, says Peter, was baptized in the waters of the flood. We are baptized into the overwhelming flood of the sufferings of Christ. This is the type of Noah. And Peter just says it in plain language, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. And so we are immersed in Christ by the Spirit. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6. We're going to look deeply into this idea of immersion next week. There's an idea that we can't forget. Notice the parenthesis in the King James translation. Actually, the parenthesis is there in Greek. It is there as a break in a periodic sentence. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Parenthesis, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Peter absolutely agrees with Paul in this. You remember back in Romans 6, 7, and 8 where Paul's wrestling with the idea of indwelling sin? Sure you do. Paul says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul realized that he was baptized into Christ, but he still retained the filth of his flesh. Now, Pardon me, but I think that's suffering. Suffering is knowing who Christ is, what he's like, and knowing that in this life you can never be like that because you're laboring in a body of death. You're laboring with sin, temptation, lust. And something in you wants to be like Christ and something else in you is saying, oh, I can't be like that. There's something that's keeping me away. So there's a state of internal tension, suffering. This internal tension produces obedience to God's will, if properly understood. And we're going to really get into this deeply next week. Verse 22 says, right after that, By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Peter's concluding chapter in this letter deals with this vital link between suffering and obedience. And it's a huge subject, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on it. I'm just thankful that a man like Peter, a family man, a man who knew suffering, a man who knew personal failure, a man of passions that occasionally led him to a point of failure, a man tempted, a man who knew pain, challenge, wrote this letter. <laughs> we can read it. We can say, I know what he's talking about. I've felt just the same way, and I've fought the same kinds of battles that he's writing about, and if he could make it, I can make it too. That's the message of this letter.